I learned about this thing at work recently. It's a what it's a website you can go to called Sounds of Colleagues. Sa- well, sounds of Collies. Like the dogs. Colleagues. Um. <laughs> sounds of Collies.com. I learned about it at work. <laughs> Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. I would go to that website too. Sounds of colleagues. <laughs> okay, understood. <Yes. laughs> but yeah, it's a it's a website that recreates the sounds of the workplace. In case you're feeling lonely working from home these days, <laughs> <laughs> that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Yeah, and it's got uh. sliders. You can slide them up and down to like increase or decrease oh. the the mix so to speak. So you've got room tone, coffee machine, people, printer, open window, telephone, keyboards, rain on window, and office dog. Oh my God. Do you have like loud (laughs) asshole three cubicles down who you can always hear (laughs) yelling at his wife? (laughs) That's probably the people slider. I'm (laughs) I'm disappointed there isn't a water cooler. (laughs) Like a water cooler bubbling sound? the sound of a water cooler. (laughs) Why would it it just sounds like a big fart? What's fun about that? <laughs> that that sounds like somebody impersonating a dog underwater in that <laughs> one. <laughs> You're a good boy. Good boy. <laughs> sounds of <Collies.com. laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> podcast that doesn't give a shit about spoilers. We just want to talk about the movies. My name is Megan Kearns. I'm a contributor to Edge Media Network, and I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. My name is Old Man Jenkins, but you can call me (laughs) Dave Riedel. (laughs) And I write occasionally for Salt Lake City Weekly, and I too am a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. And my name is Young Man Jenkins, but you can call me Evan (laughs) Cream. I'm a co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. Yeah, you are. <laughs> yes, I am. Indeed. Yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're having a very lively and <laughs> jovial opening, but we're actually going to be segueing mm-hmm. in a moment into something that's a bit more somber. Um, we This week, we have some films we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Lingua Franca. Class Action Park, and Bill and Ted Face the Music. And Mm -hmm. before we dig into those films, though, we are going to be talking about actor Chadwick Boseman and our favorite performances of his, because of course, tragically, he passed away and we want to honor his life and his incredible body of work. Yeah, we do. Yeah. But before we dig into that, before we get super serious and super somber, I do want to make an announcement. This was on our social media, but in case Ooh. you don't follow us on social media, although you should because, you know, we're pretty cool. Because what the hell is yeah. wrong with if you're not? <laughs> Jesus, fuck. That is a good question. <laughs> but I also want to let you know, for those of you who don't follow us on social media, or maybe you just missed this, um, I actually was a guest on another podcast. Uh, I was a guest on the Screen Fix podcast. And on that It was a episode, good episode. I listened to it. What'd you yeah, say? Yeah, me too. It was a good episode. I listened Yay! to it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you guys liked. Yeah, they're uh, great hosts, um, JC and the Lady Wan. And their podcast is all about fixing a film, whether it's a film they liked, disliked, loved, you name it. They want to talk mm-hmm. about what could make the film even better. And so on that episode that I was on, we talked about Project Power. So if you or pill popper is one of you kept calling it or whatever. <laughs> they talked about that a lot. Yes, pill power. <laughs> I know. That's why, like, now I have to actually actively think, like, oh yes, Project Power, not pill power. Yeah, <laughs> or pill popper. <laughs> so yes. Yeah, so if you have not had the opportunity to listen to it, please do follow them. They're a great podcast as well. So yeah, check it out. Let us know what you think. It was a lot of fun, yeah. and I, I want to break in here real quick. Uh, We used to have a similar segment on the show, Megan, before you joined. I don't remember what it was called, but it was something like Dr. Dr. Chris. Dr. Chris. Yes, I do (laughs) remember that. Dr. (laughs) Dr. Chris, script doctor. But he would only doctor movies he hadn't seen. What? That I was not aware of. We would describe the (laughs) movies and he would be like, okay, here's what you need to do. 
So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's so kind it, of amazing. Yeah, it reminded me of that. But <clears throat> anyway, it did, we didn't do it very much because Chris usually saw more movies than we did. So, you know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> But yes, I'm glad you guys liked it. I'm glad you listened. And listeners, I hope you check it out too if you haven't already. So let's get the show started. We are going to begin by talking about the incredible, talented, seemingly lovely person, Chadwick Boseman. And we're going to talk about our favorite performances. My favorite Chadwick Boseman performance is actually an OG spoiler piece film. I think it was possibly episode three, four. It was it was definitely in the first three. few episodes. We talked about Get On Up. Um, oh, yeah. Which is the James Brown biopic. <laughs> and Chadwick Boseman is just incredible. So this week in our Patreon segment, we talked about 42. And we talked a lot about his performance in that. And it is just Chadwick Boseman's performance in Get On Up is just so drastically different in in just the most amazing ways. He just, he completely throws himself into the role of James Brown. And although he doesn't really look similar to him, he's got the mannerisms, he's got the moves, he's got the energy. Like he, in my opinion, becomes James Brown in that movie. And he's just, like people called James Brown the hardest working man in showbiz, and it feels like Chadwick Boseman lives up to that <laughs> mantle because oh, he's sure. just so incredible in this movie, and it's kind of a zany movie, and I and I feel like that's appropriate to James Brown and his life and being such a larger than life character. But to me, this is one of the performances that really stuck with me because it is so drastically different from some of the other roles where he plays much more kind of reserved reined in characters. So I just had a lot of respect for him going after this role and playing, you know, arguably a controversial figure like, you know, James Brown had some problems in his life. And so, you know, it's, he's not an easy person to, to tackle and to, to do that gracefully and to make him sympathetic, even in times in the film when he's not a sympathetic person, I think takes a special performer and that's, part of the reason why I love Chadwick Boseman in this role. And I just think he's incredible. So if you haven't seen Get On Up, I highly recommend it. If for no other reason, just just see Chadwick Boseman do something completely different and just excel at it. I agree with all of that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I have not seen it yet, so I can't agree. But you convinced, I was going to see it anyway. And now you've doubly convinced me. (laughs) You spoiler pieced her into seeing it, Evan. There you go. Yes. Off to an early start. (laughs) You know, well, and especially thinking about 42 and all of the detail and, you know, research and studying that Chadwick Boseman did to play Jackie Robinson. After now having seen 42, I can only imagine he did the same thing for James Brown. So I'm excited to see how Mm -hmm. that uh, performance comes to fruition. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, film is a mixed bag, but his performance is just off the charts. Yeah. Great. Very true. So, Dave, why don't you tell us your favorite Chadwick Boseman performance? I'm pretty sure it was Marshall. <laughs> it, it was. <laughs> <laughs> no, it it is Marshall. I, you know, Chadwick Boseman is one of those performers who I just I just like him. Um, even in that terrible cop movie he was in a year or two ago, I think it's called Twenty One Bridges. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one of those movies where it's just mediocre at best, but he still gives one hundred percent of a performance in that movie giving these lines that have no business being spoken by a human being like (laughs) tangible quality that you think hey this person there's a person out there who thinks like that and talks like that and I believe him and so uh, that's not my favorite Ted Boseman performance (laughs) my favorite is Marshall and uh, partly Mm because I just love a good courtroom drama which this movie is Mm-hmm. But um, okay, correction. It's not a good courtroom drama. It's it's another one of those movies where he's better than the movie. Um, I think he's very good. Actually, I think most of the performances are good. I am uh, yeah. I am not a compliment Kate Hudson kind of person, but even she is good in this movie. Um, so she's good, and Chadwick Boseman is good, and Josh Gad is good, and and the movie kind of sticks close to what happened. Oh, Sterling K. Brown is very good in a very unsterling K. Brown kind of part. 
yeah. uh, and it's about uh, one of Thurgood Marshall's earliest cases. Uh, Thurgood Marshall, first uh, uh, African American on the American on the United States Supreme Court, uh, lawyer for the NAACP, um, big civil rights figure. Uh, this is one of his first, uh, you know, big cases, and it's about um, this. Dri- this driver, this black man in Connecticut who's accused of raping his uh, white employer and the mm-hmm. case. Um, and whatever you think happened, if you've ever seen an episode of Law & Order, probably happened. Um, but what is really uh, sticks out to me in the movie, which makes it work as well as it does, is Chadwick Boseman and Josh Gad have a really good... Um, they have really good chemistry as two mm-hmm. kind of at loggerheads attorneys, one who really wants to represent the case, Thurgood Marshall, and the other who really doesn't want to represent the case, um, Sam Friedman, Josh Gad, and how they come to respect one another. I mean, it's very by the numbers. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. The screenplays vary by the numbers, but... Um, this is another one of those performances where Chadwick Boseman just does so much when he's not talking, you know, um, mm-hmm. like just there's, there are numerous scenes where he's in the courtroom and, and the judge James Cromwell has instructed Thurgood Marshall that, uh, he is allowed to participate in the case cause he's not admitted to the Connecticut bar. Um, so he's, you know, you're allowed to participate in the case, blah, 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 but you're not allowed to speak in the courtroom. And just like watching the way he writes things down to Josh <laughs> Gad, it's just like, Jesus Christ, yeah. this guy is more expressive than I am. <laughs> and I'm fucking <laughs> screaming at the top of my lungs. So, you know, uh, it's just really the, the courtroom stuff always gets me when you have actors of that caliber. Like I said, James Cromwell's the judge. Dan Stevens is the opposing attorney oh. playing a serious fucking dirt bag. I might add. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah. And doing it sure. very well. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. And um, just kind of watching, uh, unfortunately it, it, it shares something with 42 in the sense that sometimes they get away from Thurgood Marshall a little bit and it, and, it doesn't become Josh Gad's story, but the um, the idea is that his character as a Jew also faces uh, discrimination, maybe not of the same kind that uh, Thurgood Marshall would, or certainly the defendant in the case would. But you know, there's there's just a lot of like, oh, Jews have it bad too, and I have to live here in Bridgeport mm-hmm. afterward. And it's like, this is Thurgood Marshall's story. Can we get back to this place? So, yeah. um, but that being said. And I, and I don't really like to compliment Josh Gad on things because, you know, like, you know how I feel about Josh Gad. He's all right. <laughs> He's really good in this, too. So to watch the two of them, like, do this. And uh, actually, it's the first time I saw Josh Gad. And I'm like, oh, I see why people like this guy. So um, it was just it was it, I watched it again last night before we did the show because I knew we we're going to be talking about this. And it's another one of those movies where, like, the stark uh, language and just the the way I, I really, I don't know what the right word is. I appreciate the way that this movie is just like, these people are fucking racists and this is the language they use because it's just, I think especially in this time when the president is a white supremacist, you need to have in popular culture, people saying like, these people are fucking racists, all kinds of people. Nothing has changed since 1940. I think that's important. And I think this movie does that, which makes it more important. And Chaswick, Chadwick, Bose, I keep calling him Chaswick. Maybe we should just call him Chaz. I wonder if his friends called him Chaz. Probably not. Um, probably not. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Because hey, Chad, like, but yeah, not Chaz. I know. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, my great great grandfather's name was Chaz, and that's part of the reason I, <laughs> I bring it up. <laughs> All right. Anyway, well, Charles, but everyone called him Chaz. And uh, anyway, um, it's just another solid, solid Thurgood Marshall performance in a screenplay that you know needs to be better, but he elevates it in the way that, you know, he, he was such a stellar performer that he's like one of those performers. Like he gets material that's all right and he makes it better than it deserves to be. Um, and so for that reason, it's definitely worth watching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about you, Megan? What's your favorite Chadwick Boseman? Well, I was going to say, Dave, I wasn't really interested in seeing Marshall, but now you spoiler beast me into it. Uh-huh. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you, you want to know what did it? What the singular thing you said that did it for me was the, the furious scribbling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that it is furious. That did it for me because I love when an actor uses their physicality or their body language in kind of an unconventional or different kind of way to convey, you know, things wordlessly. And so I love it. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm excited to see it. 
Um, so my favorite performance is Chadwick Boseman's most recent performance as Storm and Norman in The Five Bloods by Spike Lee. And it, oh, hell yeah. it's so interesting because, you know, we've been talking about films that Chadwick Boseman has done that are like, eh, all right, or they're okay, or, you know, they're fine. This is a film that's actually amazing. And mm-hmm. so to see him in a film that's amazing, and it's not the only film he's done that's amazing, I would argue, but to see him in a film where everybody's bringing their A game, the film is incredible, the, the script is incredible, cinematography, direction, you name it, everything. And Chadwick Boseman is still standing out and is still unbelievably phenomenal in this performance. Yeah. With not much screen time. And Correct. he still is all still. over this movie. He's still magnetic. Mm-hmm. And what I love about his performance in this, because, you know, we talked about The Five Bloods on the show before. I talked about how much I loved Delroy Lindo in it. And I do. And I think Delroy Lindo, you know, is absolutely a powerhouse in this. But Chadwick Boseman is doing something incredibly different. And he's doing something that's equally powerful, but it's so restrained and so quietly powerful. And I kind of love that contrast between them that, you know, Chadwick Boseman, you know, is kind of, he's not rageful, but he's raging against this incredibly oppressive system and, you know, and, and systemic racism. And he's teaching his, his comrades about, you know, racism and not that they don't know about it because they obviously have experienced it, but he's teaching them, you know, about black power and he's teaching them, you know, you know, philosophies and, you know, thoughts and about activists. And it's just, and he's teaching them about history and it's just incredible to watch. And Chadwick Boseman brings so much to this performance and especially the fact, you're you're right, Dave, the fact that he doesn't have a ton of screen time, especially compared to the other actors. And he really makes the most of every single moment he's on screen. Like that shot where it's, again, the the specific shot I'm thinking of, it's, it's again, wordless. But when he's, when the camera pans over from Delroy Lindo and it's in profile of Chadwick Boseman and he's looking up when he's holding his gun and the light's like streaming down, it's just like he's not saying anything there, but yet his his body language and his facial expressions are saying everything. And it's just, it's so impressive to watch. And I just, I love that performance. I love that film. And his performance is just incredible. And it might be easy to overlook it in a way just because Delroy Lindo has the flashier role. He has the more overt role. But Chadwick Boseman is equally impressive and just adding so many layers and so much nuance to that performance. But I love it. Good take. Really is incredible. Good take. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> I just, I think he brings so much to every single thing he does. And you're right. And Dave, you've said it. Evan, I think you might have said this too. But everything he does, he just, he elevates the material and he just, he just makes it better. Just makes it better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I feel like I know that we didn't, um, none of us picked this, but I think we'd be remiss if we didn't at least briefly mention Black Panther just because it was such, you mm-hmm. know, kind of a historic role, you know, being a black superhero. Not that he was the first, of course, because Blade was, but, you know, still it's, it's, it's an impressive role and an impressive film. I think it's yeah. an impressive film, Dave. I know you're lukewarm on it, but <laughs> Agreed. although you think I it has good ideas. It. But. I do. Mm-hmm. I think it's a solid, solid, solid base for a story. I just think like a lot of Marvel movies, and this is not particularly Black Panther, I think it drags when it doesn't need to. That's what I think mm-hmm. more than anything. That's fair. I actually don't agree though. I think there I think mm-hmm. there are a couple Marvel films that are outstanding, and I think Black Panther is one of them in addition to its ideas. I think Rachel Morrison's cinematography is incredible. I think Ryan Coogler's direction yes. is incredible. I think Michael B. Jordan mm-hmm. is incredible. I think, you know, Denai Guerrera, you know, every, I think there's so many facets of this film that I just think are, are really brilliant. And again, again, it's even though Chadwick Boseman is, you know, the protagonist and he is the superhero, it's a little easy to overlook him because my, for me, this is Michael B. Jordan's film in many ways because Killmonger is... Still, without question, one of my absolute favorite villains. He's so complex. He's amazing. Michael B. Jordan Mm -hmm. is amazing in that role. So it's easy to focus on Michael B. Jordan instead. But Chadwick Boseman is also amazing. And again, brings so much depth and nuance and complexity to a role that I think if another actor who wasn't at his level didn't have the same caliber, it could just be kind of a like, "Eh, whatever role. And he Mm -hmm. just makes the most of that role and, and gives it so much 
Yeah, it's true. I mean, I just rewatched Black Panther last night and it is, I, I think it's, I agree with you. I think it's one of the best Marvel films. Um, mm-hmm. And Chadwick Boseman is amazing. And even though, like you said, it's, it's kind of easy to overlook how good he is because Michael Jordan, loom, Michael B. Jordan, just, he looms so large as a yes. villain. He's, I think the most compelling villain of the Marvel franchise thus far for me. Oh anyway. yeah, easily. Also has maybe the best, best death scene of a Marvel villain. Mm. In, in a Marvel movie. Oh yeah. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also I think if I read this correctly, it was Chadwick Boseman who changed a line in the film for Killmonger where when Killmonger's talking about where he wants to die, he wants to die in a different place. And mm-hmm. Chadwick Boseman came up with that. But anyway, like, like I love that Chadwick Boseman is coming up with lines for like other characters. Like, I just think mm-hmm. that's kind of amazing. But yeah, but it, but again, it just speaks to how good of an actor Chadwick Boseman is. So, do we have do we have any last shout outs for anything? Or I think we've covered. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, those I mean, are the good ones. Just to <laughs> also mention that it's uh, very sad that we lost such a decent human being and marvelous talent, and it happens too often. Yeah, it is an incredibly, incredibly tragic event, mm-hmm. and it's definitely sad to think about what he, what else he could have done, not just in you know acting, but of course his you know his life and yeah, yeah, just really, really yeah. sad. It's a shame. Yes, um, and if you want to hear us talk more about Chadwick Boseman, definitely check out our Patreon segment on Forty Two. Okay, mm-hmm. so we're going to segue now into our films for this week. And our first film that we're going to talk about is Lingua Franca. And Boo! Sorry, I haven't seen it. You didn't see it! <laughs> I mean, no, I just said that. <laughs> Sorry. This is a thing that I used to do with Sam all the time. Whenever Sam said, oh, this movie, I just saw it. It was great. And then he says the title every time I go, boo! So I don't know why I felt like doing that, but I don't know. Sam, if you're listening... <laughs> So, yes, the Lingua Franca is by Isabel Sandoval. She is a trans Filipino woman. She's an immigrant. And this is a film that is not autobiographical, but it is in many ways because it is based on a lot of her experiences. So Mm -hmm. we are going to talk about it. Evan, you and I saw it. Evan, tell me, what did you think of this film? I thought it was good, but not great. I really liked the themes in the story and i thought that it might go some more compelling places i feel like overall i wish it focused more on olivia uh and a little less on on alex and i felt like the ending for me was a little abrupt it felt like like it just kind of came up and i was bummed because i was looking to see more from this movie i feel like it kind of got cut off at the knees toward the very end so yeah (laughs) i guess those are my like kind of high level thoughts about the movie i think it's timely i I mean Mm -hmm. i think there's definitely a lot of very relevant themes for what's happening in our country right now The, Mm -hmm. the immigration story is always been relevant but it feels particularly relevant because we get you know clips from trump talking about immigrants and we see ice raids in the film and it just it it hits very close to home for the immigrant experience now in the current environment we live in so it definitely brings a lot of that it 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 you know it's not only an immigrant film it's also about you know the trans experience and the trials and tribulations that that come from that as well um it's just I don't know. I feel like there was a lot of good here, and it didn't quite didn't quite uh, make it for me. But what did you think, Megan? Well, I want to back up because I realized I didn't really give much of a plot summary. <laughs> so I'm going to. Oh do yes, that. that's true. Yes, I'm going to do that, and then I will tell you what I think. Um, uh, but yes, so um, Isabel Sandoval, um, she wrote this, edited this, and directed this, and she stars in it. And she plays Olivia, who is a caretaker, um, a care worker of an older woman who is struggling with dementia or Alzheimer's Mm -hmm. and she is looking to marry someone so she can get a green card because she does not have one because in the Philippines, the Philippines have, they, that country has passed a law where if you are a trans person, you cannot change your passport. You cannot legally Mm -hmm. change your passport or your identification to change your gender on your documentation to indicate your 
correct gender, the gender that you are. And it'll instead have the one that you're assigned at birth. So because she can't do that, um, it makes it more difficult for immigration purposes. So that's why she's Mm -hmm. trying to marry someone. And she meets Alex, who is the grandson of Olga, the woman she takes care of. And he is living with Olga and Olivia there too. And they begin to have a relationship. And so it's about that, about about Mm -hmm. Olivia, but also their relationship. And so... I liked this. I really liked this. Um, I do know what you mean about how the film focuses too much on Alex. I wish it focused way less on Alex because mm-hmm. honestly, I didn't give a shit about him at all. Didn't care. Yeah. Did not and care. He's kind of a dick. Anyway, yeah, he's he kind of a dick. Fuck yep. up anyway. Yep. So yep. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, it's interesting because so he's, he is an alcoholic. He's in AA and he immediately mm-hmm. goes off the wagon, like literally his like first night there. And that could have been something interesting to explore, but they don't. And so Mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting. Like it's, I'm, I'm curious about that choice, like why it wasn't. And, you know, you could argue, well, it's Olivia's story and I would agree, but if I just, yeah, it's, 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 I don't know. I'm not explaining it well, but yeah, I just, it it was an interesting choice to me to kind of not dig into that more if you're going to have him right. on screen so much. But yeah, but I, I did not, not... Sorry, I was going to no, say no, no, to ahead. add on to that it, and to not really uh, not show more of what the consequences are of right. that. You know, it's like he's, yeah. he, he works for his uncle at a meatpacking plant and mm-hmm. he gets fired by his uncle and, and rehired later. But other than that, there's no real stakes or consequences for his mm-hmm. drinking. Well, I mean, there is one. He has a horrific altercation with his grandmother where he like True. grabs her try, because it's on the schedule that she's supposed to have a bath. And she's like, get your hands off me. Don't you ever touch me like that again. And it's because he's still drunk or has a hangover or something. And so, mm-hmm. you know, that's horrifying. But you're, but I know what you mean. I know what you mean. We don't see more um, kind of repercussions. Um, but yeah, but I didn't... as a as a character, I did not care about him at all. Did not, did not care about him. But Olivia, mm-hmm. I did. And I really, I also really, I really enjoyed Olivia's friendship with her friend Trixie, who was also a Filipina trans woman. And hearing mm-hmm. them talk about, you know, kind of their experiences and their struggles, I found really interesting. And it was also fascinating to me to hear them talk about their childhood. And yes, so that I really liked. And I would have liked to have seen Trixie more in the film because I think she's great. But yeah, so what I loved about this film actually was I love that we see... So it's it's super rare to have a trans person in, starring in a film to begin with and especially a trans woman mm-hmm. of color. And I love that that this is her film and we're seeing her story and especially a trans woman of color who's an immigrant. Like kind of all of these things are great that we're seeing. I especially love her scenes where she's masturbating and her sex scenes because it's so focused on her desire and her sexuality Mm -hmm. and it feels very intimate. And I really appreciated that. Um, And actually, interestingly, Isabel Sandoval said in an interview that that was the first film, the first scene they filmed because she wanted to get it out of the way because she was like feeling kind of, you know, tense about it or nervous about it. And she said that it was simultaneously like she she was glad she filmed it, but she also felt that it was kind of a bodily violation. And so she was mm-hmm. glad that she like filmed it right away and got it out of the way. But what I also really love that she talked about in this interview, which was an interview with Vulture, she said that the only people in the room were her, um, the actor who plays Alex, um, Eamon Farrar. And I think that's his name. God, I should have that at the ready. Uh, um, I was, a- Eamon Farron, I think. Farron, thank you. I thought it was Farrar. Thank you. Um, but yeah, it was it was her and him and the DP, and that's it. And that's really how sex scenes should be filmed. They really should just be, you know, the actors involved, maybe the director and the DP, and that's it. Nobody else. And I love that that she talked about that. Um, what I also love is so I love the ending. Like I think it's interesting that you talk about how it ends so abruptly. I absolutely loved it. That actually, I was kind of like going along, going along. And I'm like, I like this film. But the ending for me really, really sold me on the film and made me love it that much more because Alex has essentially stolen her passport because his friend Mm -hmm. is drunk at his house and he's rummaging through 
Olivia's things, which is so creepy yeah. and gross. And he finds mm-hmm. her passport and he finds that her passport is, you know, states her incorrect gender. And he like tells, you know, um, Alex and he uses a slur, which is gross and mm-hmm. fitting for that character, but still gross nonetheless. And so Alex, instead of giving back Olivia her passport and saying, you know, this is what happened. He doesn't. And he doesn't, he doesn't reveal that he knows that she's trans. He doesn't mm-hmm. reveal the passport. And he co- concocts this ridiculous bullshit story about how some, is. some thief came in with a ski mask on and she's already petrified that ICE is going to come at any mm-hmm. moment and arrest her. And he's like, yeah, it could have been ICE. I don't know. And it's like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? Right. And it's so gross that he's doing this. So then she'll need him and need to marry him. Like, it's just the height of gross, disgusting, manipulative, abusive behavior. And so he keeps talking, like by the end, near the end of the film, he's like, we should get married, we should get married. And she's like, I have something to tell you. And he's like, I already know, I already know, and I don't care, and I want to marry you. And then, you know, she knows that he has the passport. And I love the way it's shot. It's shot so you see them, but you're also seeing them reflected in a mirror, but it's kind of done in like a really unusual way. So there's a lot of fragmentation, which I love. And I love that he's like, I can fix this. I can make this better. And she doesn't say anything, but it's pretty much like, you know, like, no, she's fucking done. She's done. Like he's violated her trust and it's over. And then it skips ahead a bit and you hear her talking to her mother on the phone. And yeah, she has an appointment to meet someone else to marry them. And I love, and she has a new job. And I'm just like, I love that. And Isabel Sandoval in that interview said that she wanted to show a different trans experience. Like she wanted to show a different trans woman, not one that is typically shown on screen where she's reclaiming her agency. And she's like, no, I'm not going to put up with this shit. I'm not going to be with someone who I cannot trust. And even if it's an arranged marriage, I need to be able to trust you. And I just, I loved that. So I love that ending. And I think it's absolutely perfect. Yeah. I, I, I could see why. I could see why he would dig it and why other people would dig it. I just, I got so <laughs> wrapped up in that, that moment, that scene where they're having the kind of mm-hmm. what I would call a breakup conversation. Like it's clear they're not going to stay together when he's, she demands her passport back and he gives it back to her. But mm-hmm. I don't know. I got so wrapped up in the scene and I had spent so much time with these characters that to just like abruptly cut to her talking about oh i've got a new job i've got a new guy like it makes sense logically but for Mm -hmm. me i was just kind of like emotionally feeling stunted by it you felt (laughs) abandoned (laughs) i did i did one thing i also want to talk about is the cinematography in this movie Mm -hmm. it's very dark and i think that also affected my enjoyment of it Uh, like there are times where i can appreciate a dark scene but there were so many times where i was like can I please see what's happening to these characters? I want, I want to see, like, I want to see what's happening. And I just feel like I'm sitting in like a dark room or a dark corner right now. That's, I did not have that experience at all. I could see everything. (laughs) And I watched it in the middle of the day. That's so funny. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) I think you might have an issue with your TV because every time there's a dark film, you say that. (laughs) (laughs) This one felt particularly dark. I mean, I was watching on a laptop, but still, mm, it's just was like, why. yeah, yeah, that's fair. No, that's fair. But yeah, I did not have that same experience. I was able to see everything. I had the light shining in my window. And I was good. So, so there you go. Your mileage may vary. Of course, <laughs> you may not be able to see the film or you might be able to see it perfectly. Who knows? <laughs> but yeah, there's, I do also love the, um, the infusion of you know, not that I love hearing Trump because trust me, I fucking do not. But Mm -hmm. I love the infusion of her, you know, kind of obsessively, you know, watching the news, listening to these, you know, horrific comments that Trump makes about immigrants and these racist comments. And yeah, and I, and that actually changed the script because this, that was not going to, there was not going to be such a focus on immigration until Trump got in office and was like, you know, like being horrifyingly racist and everything. So I think that's also really compelling and fascinating to think about how the script evolved, you know, with the political travesty that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would have liked more of that. I think I think I would have liked more sitting with Olivia and, and finding more of her thoughts and feelings on this and having less 
of Alex coming around and being very dismissive Ugh. of her concerns. I know. I'm being so <laughs> creepy. God. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It, I will say I do like that. It kind of does subvert certain um, expectations or narratives about trans women. Like, a, like there's certain, there's certain scenes that you kind of, if you, if you watch more than a couple of films that feature trans women, you kind of grow to expect certain scenes, certain conversations, certain things. And I was glad that actually almost none of that is in the film, which is kind of interesting that it kind of goes in a different way, you know, about, you know, a trans woman and her body and her identity and everything. But yeah, but I also would have liked to have heard more. I mean, part of me is kind of glad that it doesn't focus so heavily on her being trans because that's so often what happens on film. Or in you know on screen, but I kind of yeah. also wanted. I felt myself kind of wanting more, especially about the fact that you know, kind of that intersectionality of her being you know trans and an immigrant. But yeah, but I think the film does a great job bringing those issues up. I just, but but I agree. I would have liked to have heard more about it too. Less of Alex, more of her. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but sure. yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to say about the film? No, I think that covers it. Okay, cool. I will just say that, and I know you feel this way too. I know you you kind of already touched on it. But I love that this is a film that exists. And I love that because we need more Mm -hmm. trans filmmakers and we need more trans people who are actors in trans roles. So I love that. If nothing else, I I think it's a film worth seeing just for that. But yeah. For sure. And I also liked it too. So bonus. (laughs) (laughs) All right. But let's talk about the wild documentary, Class Action Park. Oh, man. I've been so excited (laughs) to talk about this. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) Holy Jesus. I mean, somebody in the movie says that this only could have happened really in the seventies and eighties. That's true. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like if there was even so, if there were two hospital visits in a day at a random amusement park in New Jersey, they'd probably be shut down for two weeks for an investigation. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. How many confirmed deaths were there at class at at action (sighs) park? Five. I mean, there were several. Yeah, at least they also had to hire their own ambulance, which is crazy. And they were uh, uh, running two at one point because they needed that much. And then I was looking up after the movie about some other stuff, and there were other things that they don't even mention in the documentary, like they had jousting. Oh my god! You could joust at Action Mm -hmm. Park. (laughs) Yeah. Evan, uh, since I, I think, uh, Megan, do you think Evan should give us the five cent tour on this or 10? I do. No, I do. Because Evan, I know you've been you've been dying to talk about it. I think you should oh do it. Oh my God. I have been dying to talk. I mean, we talked about this very briefly last week when mm-hmm. Dee Crimmins was on. And um, so Class Action Park is a, a documentary that's available on HBO Max. It focuses on the dangerous, legendary, whatever, infamous water <laughs> <Notorious>. park, <laughs> Action Park in New Jersey, and the slew of injuries, crimes, death that came as a result of this park. And <laughs> I'm not laughing at the death, but it's just so absurd hearing about it, an amusement it park absurd. and death and crime. Well, yeah, basically, well, Im- imagine if Donald Trump ran a water park. But even that's, he wouldn't invest in this. This was too yeah, crazy for I him. Know. That's what's that's, crazy. I'm just saying that's one he, of the crazy things. Yeah. If, if he had run it, I'm just saying all of these things would have oh. happened. I'm not saying, you know. 100%. You're yeah. so right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I loved the hell out of this documentary. Um, <laughs> it's very funny. It has a terrific mix of interviews of celebrities, but also people who worked at the park. It has, in my opinion, some of the best sound bites I've ever heard in a documentary. <laughs> They're just that funny. Like one of the first notes I made was someone saying it was a place where death was tolerated. And <laughs> That's it's my favorite line. <laughs> it's hilariously delivered. And there's so many hilarious lines. And I have to say, I haven't seen Chris Gethard too much. But he is a prominent feature in this documentary and he is just so funny and so real at the same time in his recollections about class a- or uh, action park. I almost called yeah. it class action park. He was my um, favorite interview. He was my favorite interview subject. Yeah, he's he's just terrific. And so this the documentary is narrated by John Hodgman, who some of you know for his podcast, Judge John Hodgman. I, I notice uh, him mostly know him mostly from The Daily Show. That's how I know. Yeah, yeah me too. That's true. And he was the PC in the Mac PC commercials, as yep. some might remember. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's just it's a fascinating story, and it just it for me it does such a great job of balancing this macabre su- subject with humor and when it gets serious toward the end when it talks it, it kind of zones in on one family who lost their son at this park it works to me like i it feels appropriately serious but then even as the documentary is kind of wrapping up and we're getting back to some jokes i i just feel like it does a really good job of kind of balancing the humor but also keeping in mind that this is a serious thing like this is a p- a place where countless people were injured, several people died, and it's just, it's just an, it's, it's a bonkers story. <laughs> it's just the how it came to be in the seventies. It's just nuts how it continued to operate, the way its owner kind of just took over the town of Vernon, New Jersey, and and you know just had everybody in his pocket and operated with insurance from a company that he made that was a fake insurance company just so we could operate, but then didn't pay anybody. It's just, it's just nuts. Yeah. Um, it's a crazy story and I, I feel like I'm just talking too much, but the, <laughs> the documentary, in my opinion, is worth watching because it's, it's one of those stories you hear it and you're like, I can't believe this is true. Like it just, they just keep piling on things that you just like underage drinking and partying <laughs> and, and, you know, 14, 13 year old kids running rides when they shouldn't be. And even some of the attractions when they talk about the injuries that people would sustain, like the teeth, this guy who, the teeth in the loop that were giving yes. people lacerations. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> so, so real quick, there was this insane idea for a water slide that you went down the water slide and there was a loop at the end of it, a 360 degree loop, giant loop, giant loop. And people got their teeth knocked out on the top when they were still figuring out how to like, you know, not have people get their teeth knocked out in the top, but they didn't know the teeth were up lodged in the top of the thing. So once they thought they had all the bugs worked out, people are still coming out with lacerations and it turns out they're getting cut on the teeth that are stuck in the ride. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, you, if somebody told me that, like, was a, a story like I saw this movie, fiction movie, feature film, and there's this thing about this kid who goes to water park and he gets cut on teeth on this water slide. I'd be like, that's the dumbest fucking <laughs> thing I've ever heard. What a bunch of bullshit. And it fucking happened in real life. Oh my God. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> So I guess my reaction has tickled Megan's fancy. It has. <laughs> <laughs> it just, but outrageous is just the only word that I can come back to. And when Chris Gethard tells yes. that story at the end where he's like, this is what a typical Monday morning was like at my middle school is you'd go to school and you'd say to your friends, what did you do this weekend? Oh, we went to, and I'm paraphrasing, but oh, we went to Action Park and Bill got cut on the forehead and we had to take him to the hospital and he got 14 stitches. What did you do? I went to my grandma's in Freehold and he's like, those are two conversations you would have every Monday morning. I was just like, <laughs> Yes. Of course you would have that because it was so ingrained and normal that you would just nearly die at this water park every weekend. That's craziness. Oh, my God. And some people did die. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think about like some of the rides that people would go on. They'd never been on them before. Like the one where it shot you out of the tube from the side of the mountain into the freezing (laughs) cold pool. Oh, my God. I would have done that once and never. Like This is one of those things where I think I might have been... a stereotypical wimp as a kid because I would have gone on one of these rides, got cut once and been like, fuck it, I'm out of here. There's no way I would have done this. <laughs> yeah, me too. No way would you catch me. I mean, for me, there's an added element of intrigue as someone who worked in an amusement park for two summers and running rides and it just it's so ingrained in you to be safe and to engage in safety procedures. So to see a park where none of that was done and this guy was literally designing his own rides just it blows my mind <laughs> he's not an engineer he didn't have any engineers looking over <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah. my god so <laughs> i hate to bust up this party but i actually did not like this documentary at all wah, wah. Wah, wah. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so I think it's a great it's it's a great concept. Like I love that someone did a documentary on this. Um and, and the stories are ridiculous. I feel like for me, that's what makes the documentary compelling are the stories, not the actual structure of the documentary itself. So the subject is great, but not the actual structuring of the film. And 
I am not a Chris Gathard fan. And if I never saw him again, it would be too soon. I think he is in this way too much. I And I, I can't think of the other woman's name who is in it a lot too, who is on Parks and Rec and she was Shauna Multweep or whatever her name was. But Malway thank tweet. you. Yeah. But yeah, and, and, and it's like, I, okay, I get it. You want to have some humor because it's, you know, some really horrific shit. Like I get it. But they're not really the talking heads I want would want to hear from personally watching this documentary. So for me, I found myself zoning out a lot. I wasn't really into it. I wasn't really compelled. I wasn't, I just found it kind of mundane. And the fact is like these stories are just outrageous. Like I should be riveted and I'm just not. I didn't like the animation. It was way too crude and rudimentary. And I didn't, yeah, it just, none of it really worked for me. None of it. Not the tone, not the talking heads, not, yeah, not the structure, not the editing, nothing. Okay. Um, Yeah. Sorry. (laughs) It's too bad. I mean, I think the crudeness of the animation is what prevented it from being more horrifying. Just especially the thing with the teeth when Dave was talking about, Mm -hmm. it's like, you're seeing an animated guy digging in and grabbing Mm -hmm. teeth that are, you know, it's just. For me, having that animation took some of the sting out of gross and disgusting. Oh, no, I'm not saying there shouldn't have been animation. I think that's a wise choice. I just don't like the animation that was chosen for the film. (laughs) Um, But see, I actually don't want it humorous. I would have loved like a real full on like horror show of this, like because it is it's horrifying and disturbing. So for me, it's a tonal problem. I don't really want this told in a comedic way, which I know I'm probably unique in that way. (laughs) But yeah, to me, but I don't know. Like, it's funny because talking about this with people, because like, as you know, Dee Dee told us last week, she went to it. Um, I know someone else who was there (laughs) and went, who grew up in New Jersey and went there and has an injury that they've had all their lives because of going there, you know, and it's kind of funny, but for some, I don't know, for some reason, I think it's funny talking to people you know about it. I don't know why the humor just kind of feels disjointed for me watching it in a documentary. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. That's okay. So, You're allowed to be wrong. That's fine. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm only doing that because you used that one on me earlier, so. No, think- actually, you used that on us. <laughs> Because oh, oh. Evan and I disagreed with you. <laughs> right. No, you guys have used it on me before. That's what it is. Like not <laughs> this fair. episode, but previous episodes. That is fair. I don't yeah. know if I have, but anyway, anyway. Evan's definitely <laughs> used it on me before. Evan definitely has. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, and like I said, it could just be a me thing because like I said, I couldn't connect because of its tone. And that's totally fair. Cause I love that you guys loved it. Cause it's a fascinating topic. Like it really is. Like I mm-hmm. thought I was going to love the hell out of this and I just didn't. So yeah, it just didn't work for me, but I'm, I'm really glad it worked for you guys. And it's still a ridiculous, unbelievable story. Like, so I kind of <laughs> feel like it's worth watching, even though and I know it's going to sound weird because I usually don't recommend things that I don't like, but even though I didn't like it, I feel like it's worth watching just because it is so unbelievably outrageous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, Holy oh shit. God. You couldn't dream this shit up. No, you, you know? couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> so. Very true. All right. <laughs> so we're going to talk about our last film of the show, which is going to be Bill and Ted Face the Music. The uh, third film in the Bill and Ted series. Long awaited film. People have been talking about this movie for years. <laughs> for at least a decade, <laughs> and right? And it really gained mm-hmm. steam yeah. in the last, you know, two, three years that it seemed like, oh my God, this might actually yeah. be made. And it was. <laughs> and it was. And how is it? Or should we yes. talk about what it is about first? Yeah, let's talk about what it is yes. about. Um, mm-hmm. Evan, would you like to <laughs> would you like to take it? Yeah, why not? Uh, so if if you've seen or heard of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure before, we know that Bill and Ted were two guys who traveled back in time in a phone booth to pass their history reports so they could go on to become musicians and save the world and create this beautiful future. (laughs) And uh, so this is the third film in the franchise. Bill and Ted also went to hell and hung out with death in Bill and Ted's bogus journey. But anyway, we're with Bill and Ted now. They're 50, around 50. They still haven't written their big song, even though they've really been trying. And so that's kind of where the film starts is that they're told, okay, you actually have a movie's length worth of time to come up with this song and save the universe because time is literally folding in on itself and historical figures and everybody's just kind of popping up in places they shouldn't be. And the, the 
the world will end unless you guys come up with this amazing song in what did they, I think they gave minutes. them 70 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, that's that's the premise. Yeah. And the the actual movie itself is eighty two minutes. There's five minutes of lead up time until they learn they have seventy seven minutes, and then the movie is seventy seven minutes after that. So and then the closing credits. Mm-hmm. So nice and uh, lean. Just thought I'd mention that real quick. Yep. Yeah, it, it feels kind of appropriate too for us to be recording this episode on Keanu Reeves. Yeah, oh, birthday. yes. <laughs> Happy birthday, Keanu Reeves. Happy birthday, Keanu. You're one of my yeah. favorites. I love you. <laughs> Who doesn't love Keanu Reeves? I know, seriously. So what so what I know you guys have been anxiously, eagerly awaiting to see this film. So I want to know what you guys think about it. Hmm. I am of two minds. Ooh. Evan, how many minds do you have? (laughs) 1.5. Oh. (laughs) Interesting. Well, I will tell you what I thought. I thought it was really fun to see everybody again and how everything picks up pretty much right where it left off. I mean, it does a little retconning, but it's not severe. You guys know how I feel about retconning. Um, Mm -hmm. They kind of pretend that the end of... Well, if you watch Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, like they saved the world. You know, Death leaves the band for a little while, but then he comes back and then they have their biggest album ever and the stock market recovers and everything's great. Um, So apparently Mm -hmm. that didn't happen. So now they're, but we're back with everybody and you get to see everybody and you get to see their daughters, little Bill and little Ted, who are actually, you know, Wilhelmina and Thea, uh, Samara Weaving and uh, Bridget Lundy Payne and any spray. Um, it's just fun to watch this story that you love, that you have fond memories of kind of l- reach its logical conclusion. At the same time, it's a little weird that it's 30 years later and these guys are still every bit as dumb as they ever were, and they're still acting like mm-hmm. they're 20. <laughs> so that yes. was a little weird because even like really dumb people I know have grown up. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, because you know, you can be dumb, but you go through some shit and then you're not as dumb just because you have life experience, you know? Whereas these guys are just like dopes. And the good news is, <laughs> is Alex Winter and Keanu Reeves are Alex Winter and Keanu Reeves. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and I think that also the daughters don't work as well as they could. It's like the daughters need to be either more ridiculous than they are or less ridiculous. You know, um, they're just it's kind of like they're Bill and Ted light and it's supposed to be. Yeah, it's cute because they're girls. But, you know, it's not they're not well written enough to to really sustain what they end up becoming in the screenplay. Although I do appreciate that they spoiler end up becoming the people who save the world and Bill and Ted are their backing band. Mm-hmm. That I appreciated. Yeah. I thought that was a nice yeah. touch. I did. I did like that. And I also bit. saw that coming. No surprise there. But um, it was also cool to yes. see Keanu playing a flying V in the final scene. Because it's like, Keanu would play a flying V. He would. <laughs> so, but, it, you know, it, it had some yucks and it had some cool stuff. And it was nice to see Kristen Shaw in a very un-Kristen Shaw like performance. Um, and it's always cool to see Holland Taylor pop up. And I was pleasantly surprised to see that um, <laughs> Ted's dad was still around and that his brother Deacon is now mm-hmm. played by Beck Bennett as an adult. Yes, I like that choice. <laughs> so it, it's, I'm a, I'm a mixed bag. It's like I, I wanted it to be better than it was, but it's fine. You know, that's how I felt. I still, I still enjoyed it quite a bit. I can acknowledge that. It just, it's not, it's not as funny as the original films. Like it's a little clumsy, but I, I'd like that we got the original writers back for this. I like that we got, you know, Keanu Reeves and Alex Winder, I think do a great job of just really falling back into these characters and are very funny, even at times where maybe the script is not as funny. I liked, I liked Thea and Billy. I struggle with calling them daughters because I know that in real life, Bridget Lundy Payne is um, Mm non-binary. So I will call them children. (laughs) Although they're adults. Uh, Kids, (laughs) offspring. Yes. I like them. I I understand that they're kind of light versions of Bill and Ted, but I I like that because I feel like they have have more knowledge and maturity. (laughs) To me, I could see the product of them, you know, Bill and Ted and the princess... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like who are much brighter than them. Right. I could see them raising children that are brighter and less <laughs> goofy, even though they are goofy in their own ways. And I liked 
how they kind of had a parallel plot where they were going around trying to um, create this epic band throughout history. And I liked seeing new historical characters. I'm glad that we didn't try to replicate any of the the figures from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I feel like that would have been, I don't know, that just wouldn't have worked as well for me. Mm. But I, I really enjoyed this movie. Like I had a lot of fun watching it. It was predictable for sure. And, you know, it, it's, you know, it's not as in, it's, it doesn't quite capture the magic of, of at least Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. It's been a long time since I've seen Bogus Journey, but yeah, I dug it. I had a great time watching it and I watched it on a day where I really just needed to watch something good to make me feel good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's a lot to be depressed about in life lately. And I just was so happy to watch something that didn't suck. That wasn't a long awaited sequel that just utterly disappointed me. <laughs> Oh, okay. Megan. Yes, I want to hear <laughs> Megan. I don't know if you do. Um, so I have never seen the second film. I've only ever seen the first film and I saw it once when I was, I think, teenager, preteen. I don't even remember it so long ago. And so I was not excited about this film at all because not that I think like it shouldn't have been made or anything, but it just I'm not the audience that it is you know, trying to reach. But I will say, I agree with you guys that Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter, I I love them both so much as people, like just individuals, that seeing them Mm -hmm. together on screen was just delightful. And I think if it had been anybody else in the role, although I don't know why you would have anybody else in these roles, but if you did have anybody else, I don't think it would have worked. I don't think it would have been enjoyable because they're just so lovely and cheery. And I'm not going to lie, I did get a little bit choked up you know, at the end and when they're, and even before him in the beginning, when, you know, um, when Alex Winter says, you know, be excellent to each other. And that's something that's just so basic and so simple, but in these times that are really dark and awful and everything is hateful and horrible, hearing, you know, something Mm -hmm. so kind and so, so genuinely lovely is just kind of a breath of fresh air and just really, really nice. So that I really appreciated and really enjoyed. What I didn't like was pretty much everything else. Um, <laughs> I, sorry, I did not find I didn't find it really that interesting. Although I do love the quick pace, I I did it. I did appreciate that. Um, I didn't find it funny. I did not really like their children. I I know I kind of want to say daughters because they say daughters in the film. But you're right, Evan. That um, with one of them being non-binary, it's yeah. So I did mm-hmm. not like their offspring. Because, and not that I don't like that there was a focus on them, because I agree, I like the parallel kind of quest that they're going on. And I really liked that in its conception. But I don't, I didn't need to see carbon copies of Bill and Ted. I would have liked them to have had their own distinct personalities, whether, whatever that may be, whether they're wilder and, you know, goofier than their fathers or whether they're, you know, really serious and uptight or whether they're somewhere else totally different, you know, and it's also feels weird because so often children are different than their parents, you know, whether it's a conscious choice or not, whether they're rebelling or not. So, you know, children are their own individuals. They have their own goals, their own views. They're not just little carbon copies of their parents. So there's something about that that kind of bothered me. I did I did like that they were kind of the saviors of the world. But part of me also got sad about that because while I loved it, because that, that we were seeing, you know, two people who were saviors that were not, you know, dudes. There was something about it that I was like, oh, wait, is it because, you know, you're too old now and now we're, you know, the next generation, you know, can only, you can only save the world if you're like 25. So I don't know. I was probably reading way too much into that, but (laughs) there was something about that that just kind of made me sad. It's like, oh, they're older now and they're not saving the world. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a little bit of a downer. The the film is kind of, for me, erratic and kind of all over the place. For sure. Yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Which was just, sometimes that works in a film. For me, it did not work in this film. So I didn't really enjoy a lot about it, but I do love Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter and I love their enthusiasm Mm -hmm. and genuine energy and love of this film series. And it's really clear that they love working together. Like they've talked about that in interviews. Mm -hmm. It's so clear. So in that way, I really Mm -hmm. was glad I saw it. So I feel kind of, kind of mixed on it. Yeah. Yeah. I love the way they say things in unison. The, the way that they're able to do that just floors me every time. Yeah. <laughs> when they'll just be like saying things in unison, you're like, how did you get that level of coordination? How good did you get 
in terms of just kind of being on the same wavelength to be able to do that. Because that's always something that's cracked me up about Bill and yeah. Ted. One thing I noticed though, and I don't know if Keanu Reeves is a smoker or not, his voice is much, much deeper than it used to be. And Alex Winter's voice is more or less the same. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if you guys noticed that, but I was like, Keanu kind of talks like this a now. And he used to talk like this. So it's like, ooh, I know everybody's voice is generally deepen as they get mm-hmm. older, but Keanu's has like really gone down a couple of octaves. It was like just something I thought I'd mention. <laughs> I, I also appreciated that the princesses actually had things to do in this movie, even though it wasn't very much. And that one mm. of them was played by Aaron Hayes, uh, who I like very much from lots of other things, including the movie where the world ends and um, they all die inside the house. I can't remember the name of it. I see. <laughs> I, I don't think they had anything to do. And I was kind of... Did, did, do you remember them from the other two movies? They really I didn't see didn't the second anything. one. Oh, that's right. You didn't see the second Hello? one. Hello. <laughs> but I mean, in, in the first one, yeah. the first one, they don't do much of anything. I think in the second one, uh, Evil Bill and Evil Ted break up with them. And so they're not even in the movie for most of it. Right? Isn't that what happens? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they do. Yeah. And it's weird that they recast the princesses. I didn't love that aspect of them kind of trading them in for you know, like younger performers. Mm. And also... Um, Bill's dad wasn't in the movie, even though that actor is still alive and he was married to Missy at some point. So hmm, I wonder why he's not in it. Oh, well. Maybe it was a scheduling conflict. Maybe. Maybe it was. <laughs> Could be. Or maybe it was like the Michael Ontkeen thing from, um, from uh, Twin Peaks. He's like, I'm fucking retired. Fuck it. I'm not coming back. You know, so who knows? <laughs> I hate to say it, but I did find the robot character quite funny. Oh, oh Dennis. I- his, yeah, I appreciated yeah. that for some reason he had emotions and then got very needy. That was very funny. <laughs> yeah. I like that too, actually. Yeah. <laughs> like, it seems like it's the most absolutely, I mean, it is the most absolutely ridiculous thing. And I feel like, I feel like if you were like, if I heard someone describing this film, I'd be like, oh, that's going to be the thing I hate the most. But no, I actually found him quite, quite endearing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of great facial acting. You know, when you see, Dennis make a mistake. <laughs> you know. I just I, <laughs> he's I, upset. He's yeah. beating himself up over it. <laughs> yeah. Did you guys have any any other thoughts that you wanted to share? I do that? not because I know slight movie, slight things to say in my in my case. Yeah, I I feel like we 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 covered it rather quickly. I thought I would have like tons and tons to say, but no, I feel like we 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 covered it. <laughs> For me, this was enjoyable and I can acknowledge its flaws, but still say that I had a good time and it was worth watching for me because it definitely was a mood booster. Good. I can, you know, I could see how that would be. I mean, like, you know, like I said, it's not, it's not a movie for me. I'm not a huge fan of the series, but you know, I would love to see Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter do more things because they're just so lovely together. Oh, you know what I would mention too Mm -hmm. is Alex Mm -hmm. Winter's Frank Zappa documentary will be out this Thanksgiving and I am eagerly awaiting it but I just wanted everybody else to know that's what he's been doing for the last four or five years. Nice. He also yeah. was in that four hour uh, horror documentary we watched. That that's we covered. right. Yes. He, he was. In my opinion, he was the best talking head. He was my favorite. As, uh, in addition to John yes. Carpenter, he was my favorite. All right. Well, then let's do a recap. So we would definitely say see Marshall, see Get On Up and see Defy Bloods and Black Panther 2 for Chadwick mm-hmm. Boseman performances. We would say, I would say, see Lingua Franca. How do you feel, Evan? Yeah, it's, I say see it. I mean, you know my my complaints about it, but yeah, I agree that it's worth seeing for subject and representation. Mm-hmm. And Class Action Park, I think I know where you guys are, but tell mm-hmm. me if you think we should see it. <laughs> see it. I'm flashing the the horns right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I yeah I would say see it just for the subject matter, but I I otherwise I would not recommend it. But I know I was not as enamored with it as you guys were. <laughs> and then Bill and Ted <laughs> face the music. Sure. Still showing the horns. <laughs> <laughs> so. I would say don't see it, but I mean, unless you're a super big fan, then I would say, of course, you're going to love this because even if, you know, you don't think it's the best film, it's nice to revisit Mm -hmm. familiar characters who are just nice. There's something nice about nice sometimes. That's true. They're nice guys, which also is nice for lack of a better word. Yeah. So maybe I would say see it. (laughs) Maybe I rescind my don't see it. (laughs) (laughs) But all right. So... 
that's going to do it for this episode of Spoiler Piece Theater. We want to say a huge thank you to our amazing editor, Otto Clammer. We could not do the show without you, Otto. We think you're fantastic. So thank you so much for all you do. You make thank it sound you. good. We like that. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> you can find Spoiler Piece Theater anywhere you can get podcasts. We are anywhere and everywhere. You can find us at our website, spoilerpiece.com. You can also follow us on social media. We are everywhere. We're Spoiler Piece Theater on Facebook. We're at Spoiler Piece on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. So come follow us there. You can also email us at spoilerpiece at gmail.com or you can call us at 86221Piece. So leave us a message. Leave us an email. We love hearing from you. We definitely appreciate it when you reach out. If you like the show, please rate and review us. You can go to ratethispodcast.com slash spoiler piece. You can also rate mm-hmm. us on iTunes. That definitely helps us out tremendously. So please go ahead and do that if you like the show. And if you really, really, really like the show, please join our Patreon. <laughs> this week, we talked about Chadwick Boseman in 42. And we do exclusive weekly bonus episodes. And we also do monthly polls. If you're a $5 patron, Mm -hmm. you get to listen to those weekly bonus episodes and vote in those monthly polls. And if you're a $10 patron, you get to tell us what to watch each and every month, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. My name is Megan Kearns. I'm a contributor to Edge Media Network. I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. And you can follow me on Twitter at OpinionSWorld and on Instagram and Letterboxd at The Opinion. My name is Dave Riedel. I sometimes write for Salt Lake City Weekly. I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. And you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd as Dave Sees Movies. And my name is Evan Crean. I'm co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. You can follow me on Twitter and on Letterboxd as Real Recon. And we also doing this a little out of order we also want to give a huge thank you to our patrons yeah we do we want to say thank you to sean pensionar to christopher jensen bob chipman davida margolin zach pigeon chris wilkinson elisa max colville shona glasgow rory glenn shelly m mccaskill mike lord of the (laughs) sis deirdre crimmins and shauna harris thank you thank you so much patrons thanks you're the best All right. So thank you, everyone, for listening. We appreciate you. Thank you. See you next week. Bye.